Hey everyone, it's Gary. Hope you're well. Welcome to this week's live uh, Path to Prosperity weekly webinar. Uh, welcome aboard, <coughs> excuse me, to all of you uh, in, in all the programs, Flipping for Profits Without the Pain, <coughs> Turning Rental Problems into Real Estate Profits, or Rental uh, rental Profits Without the Pain, excuse me, um, Flipping Without the Risk, uh, Wholesaling, so everybody wins. And of course, investor agent, make more money, not more work. So uh, welcome to all the, the new students and all of you uh, veteran students also. And also, uh, uh, welcome to all of you who were just at my three-day event. Some, some, Many of you, obviously, we already know each other, but we had some uh, some new folks here, which was kind of neat. Um, so welcome aboard. Uh, you'll notice a couple of things here. Number one is we are live. We're not recording yet. So this is right now where this is, I'm just kind of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm speaking freely right now, <laughs> so you, know, you can all relax. But uh, make sure you have some paper ready and, and a pen or pencil. Uh, also, also rem remember that you get the recording of this the very next day. If you're in, if you're in uh, one of the programs or you're actively in um, a, at least silver level membership, you're going to get the recording of this the very next day. Um, but in any case, we just had a big three-day event. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Ryan Snow was there. Rock Thomas was there. Uh, that, that was really cool because we're all three in the same mastermind group and, you know, we get to talk to each other quite a bit, but we don't get to see each other, but a few times a year. And, um, it's just, it was just kind of neat because we were sort of out of our element. Um, normally we're all together with, with a hundred other guys and we're doing some you know, snow skiing, you know, rock climbing, racing, Ferrari, stuff like that. So they were gracious enough to come down and speak. Um, to all of you guys at this, this three-day event in Orlando. And um, in any case, uh, pretty pretty cool stuff, great reviews. I, I think they're going to be putting some some information out about that. As far as future events, um, I, I really don't know, guys. I know people were asking me, and you know, I was thinking, okay, yeah, we'll do one next year too. Um, I, I really had, I really was pleasantly surprised and quite frankly humbled by the um, response and request for, for another event. So <clears throat> we may be doing one in the New York City area towards like the end of September. Uh, please don't, this is not anything that's planned guys, it's just what we're talking about. Um, and people were asking, can we do one every every month? I, I don't know about that. I mean, I can see eventually doing that, but but right now we're all pretty busy, not just me and, and the folks that work with me, Beverly and Jody and Paul and Judy and, and Elisa, but you guys are busy, okay? So, um, but regardless, I tell you what, the, the level of education, the level of networking was pretty phenomenal. Um, and we were together really all day for, for two full days and, and most, well, you know, up till early afternoon on Sunday, to, uh, yesterday. So in any case, uh, we're going to turn a recording on here in a minute. Um, and I'll go over some, some basic housekeeping, some admin stuff, and then get into tonight's subject, which has to do with rentals. We've had a lot of feedback and a lot of... Um, input related to rentals it's, it's a matter of fact it's and I, I don't know why maybe, maybe it's something i said or something we went over in, in prior sessions but there's an, an, a pretty substantial increase in interest in rentals which is actually good i mean for me personally i i will tell you um you can't go wrong with buying rentals okay nothing wrong with flipping nothing wrong with wholesaling it's just that neither of those two allow you to build substantial wealth and income they provide it's like a, the one-off. You, you wholesale a deal, you get paid once. You flip a house, you get paid once. You buy rentals, you get paid over and over and over again for as long as you own the property. And while you're getting paid, you also build equity, okay, which means you're building your net worth. So um, lots of reasons for it. Uh, and maybe that's maybe a, we've spoken about that several times, and that's why there's a peaked interest. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, what, what do you actually do when you find one? <coughs> How do you actually check it out? Uh, we've we've had prior sessions where we went over the front end, which is how do you actually identify the properties, um, you know, the source of the properties. <clears throat> so we talked about that. And tonight we're going to talk about, let's say you actually go through, go through your list, you identify the top picks, you go visit them, you do some worksheets and you find out we're down to now maybe one to three properties. Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. At that point, what do we do? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay. Um, so in any case, let's go ahead and uh, turn on the recording here in a second. Most of you are signed on. I know it's Monday, <laughs> but uh, welcome aboard to all of you who are already on online. And for those of you who come in late, you're going to be getting some of this in recording mode. Um, if you listen to it in recording mode, um, 
it's, it's okay. You're just not going to be able to ask questions live like everyone else here. So, in any case, guys, let me turn the recording. So, hang on one second. Let's see. Okay, excuse me. We already are recording. Okay, used to me, they changed the, the platform here. We've been recording the whole time. Good thing I didn't tell any bad jokes, huh? So in any case, uh, we are recording. All right, welcome aboard to everybody, uh, veteran and new agents and students alike, whether you're in investing in, in flips, rentals, wholesaling, whatever the case is, you're an agent serving the investors, welcome aboard. Um, tonight, we are going to talk about rentals and specifically, what do you do once you identify when you're going to potentially purchase? You get down to the final piece of the puzzle, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Again, the reason is, is um, you've had, you've shown a lot of interest in the last couple of weeks. As a matter of fact, it's been a dramatic difference. Um, so I want to, I want to walk you through this process, give me the forms to use, the order to use them in, and how they all work together. This actually came up with the three-day event this past weekend. A uh, great example from Shelley from down in the, the uh, St. Pete area in Florida. By the way, real quick, sorry, some housekeeping. I am currently in uh, Savannah. I'm teaching in Savannah, Georgia tomorrow. I just taught in Jacksonville, Florida today. It was my last day in Florida going back to January 5th. I crossed over the line in January 5th from Georgia to Florida and been here ever since. Um, so tomorrow, Savannah. Uh, Wednesday, I will be in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Thursday, I'll be in Richmond, Virginia. And Friday, I'm not teaching. I'm going to be with my dad for his 84th birthday. Um, going forward, next week, I'm sorry, uh, beginning next week for four weeks, I will be in Virginia. Okay. So for those of you who are from Virginia, Maryland, you know, Washington, DC, um, just keep an eye out on the schedule and come see me at one of the classes. And uh, that's my old stomping grounds, by the way, when I was uh, growing up high school, college. And um, so I don't mind at all having dinner with some of you. In fact, I'd love that if you want to have dinner. Um, let's see. After that, it's going to be North Carolina for the first half of May followed by South Carolina, and then eventually into Georgia. All right, so a lot of you I know are in Georgia. Um, so I'll be back there. Uh, we're likely to get uh, David Evans more involved, who's from the Atlanta area. He's one of our students who's doing quite well. And he actually emceed the event this past weekend. Um, he and his dad are going forward into the, the coaching mastermind program. Um, they've got some great projects underway. So congratulations to David Evans and a big thanks to him for emceeing the event. So in any case, uh, that's my schedule. For other housekeeping, please remember to get the recording of this the next day. It comes out in the email from Beverly, okay? And uh, you'll get this recording as well as other information related to the platforms, updates to the platforms, the systems, and also updates to content. And in, any other pertinent information she has to share, please, please always get the email and review that, okay? Also remember, uh, most of what you will need is is in your members area. So myinvestmentservices.com, you log into, you log in, click on the members area, then log into the next level, which is for all of us, including me, silver level, okay? And in there, you've got all of your content. As a matter of fact, let's just go there real quick, okay? Uh, let's see. My investment services. So this is particularly relevant for all the new folks. Click on members area. Click on server level, okay? Uh, you'll typically have to log in. Mine just goes in automatically now because I, I remember, I have my computer set to remember <clears throat> logs in a password. So in any case, over here are all your resources. Monthly, I hate to call it a newsletter. I actually call it the profit booster. You definitely want to get that. That is, uh, by the way, uh, it's a private newsletter. We don't send it out to the world. It's just for you guys, okay? It's just for you guys who are members. Uh, also, the regular blog, we do that on a regular basis. Uh, cash buyer's report, you get to find out who's paying cash for properties in your area. Real big deal for uh, for all of you, actually. Um, and private lender's report, find out who's lending money privately in your area. Okay, uh, of course, they recorded all the recorded webinars are out there going back three years now. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there's, here's all the webinars here, excuse me. All the interviews, uh, all the 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 premier books, you they're, they're, those are for a fee, but as members, you all get them for free. Then there's the other books that are not free, okay? And down here, are some, more, uh, some more resources for you, uh, like this one here, Marketing Techniques and Docs, for example. 
Um, there's all kinds of stuff in there for, for all of you to use, okay? In any case, I just want to remind you that, guys, because uh, um, you really should be using this. By the way, the, uh, the community site, um, where's the community site? Let me go back to home here. All right. So for all of you who are members, make sure you go out here and uh, log into the community site and enter your, submit your, uh, build your profile, okay? Build your profile. You can get referrals off of this, uh, which means you can make money for an agent just off referrals. If you're either you're an agent or an investor, you can uh, work with each other and find each other. We don't charge for that. That's just part of your what you're paying for for the membership dues. So if your agents out there can earn commissions just by being on here, okay? And everybody else, agent, investor alike, you can actually sell your properties on here, okay? Uh, lots of cool stuff. So, all right, let's go back to where we were so we can get into the content, all right? Now, let's just very quickly do a recap on where we are. Um, first off, for all the new folks, these weekly sessions are not in any particular order. They don't, they don't follow the same order that your training follows. The training is just, you know, they... The, the training platform, Digital Talk, gives you what we call summary modules. They teach you concepts. You're just learning the concept there. You come to the members area to get all of the content, okay, where you actually get applicable, applicable tools and techniques to actually use once you've learned a concept from, from the learning platform. Okay, number one, that's number one. Number two is when it comes to rentals, you can look at the Silver Level membership site, go into the recorded webinars, and look for the webinars where the subject line has something to do with buying rentals. And you can get a lot more education by just uh, watching those and listening to them. Um, okay. In previous months, we went through the process of how you actually identify where the rentals are. Okay. The good rentals. Um, we went through that process. Then we went through the process of once you identified a, a, a subset of properties by area, how do you actually narrow the list down doing uh, basically a desktop review? Okay, that's, that's um, for most of you, that's a 12 step process in your programs. If you're, there's one for flipping and one for rentals, okay? So there are both of those programs are also in the wholesaling program and of course the investor agent program. So you follow that 12 step process, it takes you to this point, which is you've narrowed it down now to one to three properties, okay? and you're ready to pull the trigger and make an offer. We're going to do this process tonight so that you'll know exactly what to offer. Sound like a good deal? In fact, if you could, give me some feedback on the um, on the, your question box. So let me uh, let me just double check this here. Uh, hey, Fassel. Hey, Fassel. Good to see you, man, this past week, and I really appreciate you being there um, and, being, and being supportive, by the way, and helping out the other newer students. That was pretty awesome. So Fasso says, when will you be in New York City, PA, New Jersey area? So Fasso, I'll be, um, right now the schedule looks like it's going to be August in September for Northern New Jersey and New York City again. And, um, and really anything within an hour of New York City, not not way upstate New York, like not Rochester, being, um, you know, uh, Syracuse or Buffalo, none of those areas, not even Albany, just, just the city and pretty close by, maybe up the Hudson Valley a little bit. Connecticut definitely, and Northern New Jersey. That's uh, that's a October, August September. PA. I literally was just there this past fall, so I probably won't be back in PA for quite a bit. Um, closest is going to be Virginia at this point. Fashionable. Closest will be Virginia. So, so in any case, back to this. Um, this is the report we used, and you all get this in your material. This is in all of your material that all of you get. Okay, um, if you're uh, either in the uh, rental pro rental profits is at the pain program or the investor agent program, you're going to get this. Uh, but all of you have access to it through the server level membership area. Okay. Um, any case, obvious things up front. You know, you put the property address in there, of course, because you're probably looking at multiple properties. Now, we do things in a particular order when we're actually looking at a property. Once we've done some financial analysis first, we always do that first desktop analysis first. Uh, in fact, I'll show you a basic cash flow formula here in a minute. But first, I want to go through this. Assuming we've done the, the initial math based on the, the numbers that were given us. In other words, owners have provided us uh, income expense data on the property, rent rolls, things like that, you know, schedule lease from tax returns. 
we, we crunched the numbers and determined this place is worth looking at. Now we're at the place looking at it. We want to do a physical analysis at this point. So this is the form we use. So literally this is you and I, you and your agent, or you and your client if you're an agent, going to the property and doing a physical analysis. And we always start with the outside first. Now this is a real basic form. There's other forms you get that are a lot more elaborate, a lot more detailed. We just use this one for teaching purposes and you can use it in your analysis. I mean, I've used it thousands of times. But we start with the outside first because that's really when we when you come up to a property, whether you're an owner, renter, whatever, obviously the first thing you see is the outside. So you want to you want to go through the process of physical analysis the same way you would do it as, as, as if you were going to the property and looking at it and all that. We're going to do that here tonight. So first things first, we look at the grounds, okay? Landscaping, trees, shrubbery, fences, the whole nine yards. It has pool here only because we've got, you know, I've been teaching this in all 48, lower 48 states and three Canadian provinces. Um, and a lot of people have pools, particularly in Florida, Texas, California, lots of people have pools. I generally do not like uh, pools at my at my properties, okay? Flipping or renting, I just don't like them. I love pools, so give me I love swimming. I like my own personal pool, okay? But when it comes to investor properties, it adds another layer of complexity. And quite frankly, it, it adds a, another expense to deal with, several expenses potentially. So I don't like them, but pools in here nonetheless, and if you in an area where pools are really, that's everything has pools and you're probably gonna have pools too. And you gotta deal with uh, additional insurance concerns, um, safety, inspections, all kinds of stuff. But in any case, landscaping, pools, sewer or septic tank, uh, I will tell you, I don't like them, guys. I know I know some of you are in parts of the country, U.S. and Canada, where people are still on uh, septic. Um, they, uh, the, the laws have been changing in the last generation a lot, and there are a lot of septic systems out there still in existence. The challenge is, is uh, you're finding, as some of you have been finding, you're being required to convert them over to sewer systems. So I prefer properties that I'm looking at to, to have a, a municipal sewer systems, okay? Sprinkler systems and rental properties, basically another headache, okay? Now, if you're, again, in an area where there's, um, uh, you, it's very arid, you'll have more sprinkler systems, okay? Um, even on rental properties. If it's a complex you're looking at, no big deal. But if it's a single family home, I'm probably going to disable it, be honest with you. If I'm running out of single family home, it's just one more thing to go wrong, okay? Um, and any other item, like, again, fences, swing sets, uh, things like that, okay? So that's the landscaping. Oh, by the way, this does include everything right up to the curb, including the mailbox, okay? Um, now, let's look at the uh, the building. Oh, by the way, in case you're curious, yes, you would have on here sidewalks and driveways if, if that's relevant to the area, sidewalks and driveways, okay? Now, the next thing we do is we look at the outside of the building, okay? The roof. The chimney, if there is one. By the way, speaking of chimneys, uh, I also prefer to not have chimneys in any buildings that I'm buying. Um, I know they're there in a lot of older places, particularly, or if you're in the northern states or Canadian provinces, you're a lot of times you're going to have chimneys, okay? Um, what we do on rentals is we actually block off um, access to that from the inside. We actually wall it off, okay? Because you don't want tenants thinking it's okay to light fires. You know, I mean, it's just, believe me, just one more thing to go wrong. <laughs> and I've seen them go wrong, okay? So, uh, but if there is a chimney there from the outside, you want to make sure that the chimney is in good shape, not leaning or tilting or bowing or bending, and make sure there's not a lot of missing mortar. In other words, uh, missing mortar in the, the chinks between the blocks. If, if the mortar is missing, you have to do what's called repointing. You got to repoint the brickwork with fresh concrete, with fresh mortar, okay? And that can get a little bit pricey, so you wanna make sure you look at that. Uh, foundation, this is actually a very big deal. From the outside, you're not gonna really be able to determine a lot. However, you can look for fissures and cracks in the foundation, okay? Just going down to the ground level, you can't look under the ground yet, you'll do that from the basement if there is one. But down to the foundation, as far as you can go, look for cracks. If you have a crack that's, um, narrow at the bottom and broad as it go up, goes up, um, that's generally usually what we call sometimes a step crack. Sometimes it goes like this, like this, it follows the brick line. That's simply a, usually a step crack. 
Uh, and also, if it if it opens up as it goes up, but it's underneath like a window sill or something like that, that's usually because the the framing around the window has started to leak when it rains. The water it channels it, and water goes down in between the mortar and between the bricks and the mortar. It starts to push it around when it freezes, and it causes a bigger crack. Okay, those are those aren't that bad. The 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 bad problems are this: whenever you have a crack, guys, that's narrow up top and gets broader as it goes down. That's usually a sign of a much bigger problem, like a footer. The footer is underneath the foundation. You have a foundation and that sits on a footer. The footer on average and like the northern states is going to be about three feet down. Down in Florida, I mean, there's no freeze line in most of Florida. It just you can build right on top of the ground, right? So they usually build slabs. Very, not a lot of basements in Florida, a lot of slabs. Are. So in any case, the, found, the, the footers are very shallow in Florida, but northern states footers are three feet down. So in the foundation that sits on top of the footer, if, if the crack look gets bigger as it goes down, that means there's something wrong with the footer, like the footer has dropped or the footer has split or cracked. Also, if the wall, if you look at that crack, part of the wall is recessed and part further, like they're, they're not even, but one's further forward, one's further back, one side of the crack, that's another sign of trouble, okay? Um, so in any case, uh, really important that you pay attention to brickwork around the chimney and foundation. Uh, wood exteriors, I really don't like those. Um, it's hard to believe there's some of them that are still in existence, but there are. I definitely like light vinyl siding. I don't like aluminum siding. Um, but if you have wood exteriors, just know that you're gonna have a regular uh, maintenance item in the way of painting, okay, or standing, whichever the case may be, and also uh, pest control because of um, termites and things like that. It all depends on the type of wood that's being used. Cedar is, is very resistant to termites and things like that, for example. Uh, but regardless, wherever there's a presence of wood, there's a possibility of termites, okay? So in any case, any other thing that has to do with the building, we also look at the, the framework around windows and doors. We look at the eaves, the downspouts, all of that stuff we look at. And you want to make note of everything. And nowadays, the cool thing is you can take pictures with your phone. And you can also record, turn the recording on your phone, and record what you're seeing as you're talking about it. And then later on, you come home and you take your notes, okay? So that's the exterior. Now we're gonna move into the interior, all right? <clears throat> the first thing we look at in the interior are the systems. HVAC, which is heating and cooling, uh, plumbing systems, electrical systems, uh, all of the systems that make up a house. A house is really a system of systems. It's a, it's a system made up of other systems, like roofing is a system, for example, okay? Framing is a system. They're all systems. What we're looking at right now are the ones that are um, easy to isolate and potentially could be big dollars. So we definitely look at the furnace. Now, we're, none of us are inspectors, at least well, some of you may be inspectors, but I'm not. I did learn a lot from inspectors over the years. In fact, I paid an inspector to, to take me with him on three trips to look at my own properties, by the way, that I was buying and take me through everything with him step by step. I mean, I was crawling on the ground through the crawl space, up in the attic, all kinds of stuff. And I learned a lot from him. So I can pretty much look at a furnace and see that it's it's a could be a trouble spot. Um, really, what you're looking for, guys, is a lot of rust and corrosion around the, 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 fr the structure itself. If you see a lot of that, it's probably pretty old. Sometimes you get lucky and see a panel that gives you the manufacture date of the of the furnace. Okay, um, <clears throat> high efficiency is good, um, not necessary, but it is good. Um, I also look for um, when you turn the furnace on. If you hear like a loud boom, sometimes that's a real good sign of a cracked heat exchanger, which means that furnace is shot. It's not worth replacing the heat exchanger to salvage an old furnace and just just replace the furnace. Uh, air conditioning. Um, you know, outside, if you look at the out the outside unit, generally you're looking for signs of corrosion, rust, stuff like that. Um, on the inside, the the um, what happens is HVA systems, there's a, um, a plenum. And on the inside, if you look at the uh, above the furnace where there's a main trunk that goes out, if it's if it's in the summertime, frost is building up around the perimeter of it. That's usually a sign you got a problem there with the air conditioning system. Okay, that's the most common thing. Um, water heaters are pretty obvious. You know, if there's water pulling up underneath the water heater, you got a you've got a leak somewhere. 
Uh, also, if you look at the rings, in other words, you've got a water tank, a top cap, and a bottom cap. Around the caps, if you see signs of corrosion, that's usually a sign that the liner inside the lining has started to leak, okay? Um, water heaters aren't that expensive. I mean, literally six, seven hundred bucks you can replace a water heater. A good one, too, by the way. Um, now, so at this point, we're looking for other things, too. If you've got other, if you've got a, like a alarm systems, you want to look at that. Or any other systems in there, uh, water softener systems, um, uh, a sump pump, any of those systems you want to look at, and that falls into this category here. Okay. Next thing we do is we look at appliances. Again, same principle. Appliances are easy to identify. They're also easy to to repair. You just rip the old one out and put the new one in. Um, so we're looking at, uh, of course, the stove, the refrigerator, dishwasher, disposal. Um, you know, the garage door opener, if there is one. When it comes to appliances, in my rentals, I generally do not supply things like um, microwaves and dishwashers and trash compactors and things like that. Um, if they're already there and they're working, I will leave them. But what I tell the tenants is I'm only going to guarantee uh, I only will supply refrigerator and stove. OK, um, if there's an appliance there that, that's usable and they decide to use it, it's at the room and it doesn't work anymore. That's on them. I, I, I wasn't part of the lease. If they want one, they can buy one, but I'm not going to replace one because I don't maintain those. I only, repri I only maintain the required appliances, refrigerators, and stoves, okay? Um, but regardless, uh, when I'm looking at them, let's say I've got one, a stove that's ancient and a refrigerator that's relatively new, but they don't match. Uh, when I first buy a building, I generally will make sure that they match, okay? Um, I don't want to rent junky stuff. I've done that. I lived that life, and it's a hard life. Much, much better to own and rent better properties, believe me, okay? <laughs> uh, we'll talk about more of that subject on another webinar. How to actually profit from your rentals, okay? So in any case, appliances, pretty, pretty big deal. Uh, we talked about the systems already, so electrical system is one of those. Plumbing system, oh, by the way, the electrical systems, um, nowadays, it used to be we didn't get so concerned about this, but nowadays, uh, technology has evolved so much that we do not like to buy houses anymore that have the old two wire system, which means if you look inside a wire, an actual line, like that's it's, uh, got the sheathing on it, the white sheathing, you've got a hot line, a neutral line, and a grounding line, three basic pieces of wire there. The old systems had two pieces of wire. Whenever you see that, it's, it's I, you've got to be prepared. You may be spending, spending some money to replace that old electrical system. Sometimes you're lucky, you just replace the electrical panel and the meter socket outside and what's called the, the, the service line from the weather head. Um, you know, usually a couple thousand bucks will do that. But if you've got to replace actual wiring, you're looking into a lot of money. OK, now we'll tell you this. The old what's called knob and tube wiring is no longer uh, serviceable. And in fact, if you have a property inspected, Sometimes insurance companies will not insure a property with old knob and tube wiring. Not only that, if you're renting them, some municipalities, uh, some jurisdictions will not let, allow you to rent a unit with the old knob and tube wiring because it's, uh, it's aluminum wiring, which means it's very dangerous. They can catch fire. That's why we used to have house fires more often, uh, electrical house fires, excuse me. But also they're, they're not grounded. They're not safe. Okay. So uh, I used to be I would buy them and I would replace the panels and, and meter sockets and replace the wiring in the basement in the areas I could see and then cap it off after that and leave it in the walls. That was that was legal, actually. OK, and you can also put in. Um, you can put in what's called a, a ground fault interrupt a circuit on the panel, run your two line wire to that. And if there ever is a short. Um, the ground fault interrupt, which is the three line breaker, will actually trip. So that actually is a workaround uh, that we were using for a while to, to, to add some safety to the system. But nowadays, you know, I just want the better stuff. I don't want that old stuff. I want the better stuff. OK, so we look at electrical systems. All right. And we look at plumbing systems. Uh, you definitely want to flush all the toilets, run all the tubs and run all the faucets in the house before you ever buy it. Run the water and let the let the the the. the uh, sinks fill up, let the tubs fill up and let them drain and watch the draining, see if it's slow or is it normal. And then go down in the basement areas and look for the lines coming down and see if you see any, any 
uh, water coming in, water coming down, dripping, because you've probably got a leaky uh, valve somewhere or wherever there's a union, two pipes coming together. Sometimes the seal is going bad on that. Um, but also, uh, I'm looking more for um, uh, the PVC uh, waste lines, you know, basically the, the big white plastic um, or ABS. Also on the supply lines, I'm still okay with copper for the most part, but I really like to see the, the, the PEX, which is the, the really hard, dense plastic supply lines for hot and cold supply. That, th those are good systems. They're modern. If something freezes, they don't break. The old copper lines used to, used to they might be able to freeze once or twice, but eventually they're going to break on you. And there's nothing wrong with having broken water pipes in the wintertime. Good Lord. Um, but with the PEX lines, you don't have to worry about that. Okay. So plumbing, electrical, pretty, pretty important stuff. Okay. Now we're getting into windows and doors. All right. Um, tub enclosures, glass doors, uh, you know, glass and windows can replacing glass and windows and other glass surfaces like in shower doors can get a little bit pricey. Mirrors can be quite pricey. Okay. So this includes mirrors, right? Um, any case, uh, uh, by the way, I didn't mention windows and doors, but we definitely, definitely, um, we want to have new or newer windows and doors. So what I like to see in windows is double pane and uh, vinyl clad windows, usually with 30 year warranties. Um, um, American Craftsman makes a really good window that's very affordable and they got a great warranty. They're double pane, double hung. Um, Vinyl clad, which means you don't have to paint them, and they're essentially maintenance free and they'll last you 30 years, right? On doors, I like to see insulated metal doors for my exterior doors and just the basic six panel interior doors for the, for the interior doors, okay? Carpets and uh, drapery, all that kind of stuff, chandeliers. Um, you know, I don't really care so much about those. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I care about them, but I'm not going to get super excited if the carpet needs to re be replaced, because I'm going to generally replace the carpet anyways. When I get a property, I make sure it's freshly painted and freshly carpeted because I can raise the rents and get better tenants with that. It's worth the investment, believe me. Um, and by the way, we use, uh, we do not get the top grade carpet. We actually get, there's usually three weights in a carpet. We get the, the lower weight, but on the padding, we go upgrade to the middle level of the padding. And the reason is, is it'll help your carpet last longer, okay? And by the way, if you're curious, yes, I use Shaw Carpet 10-year warranty, and the, and the style is called Candy Truffle in my rentals. Shaw Candy Truffle, S-H-A-W, Shaw Candy Truffle. That's what I use. Um, on paint, I use basic white uh, satin. I don't use flat paint, don't use eggshell, and I don't use semi, I use semi-gloss on the trim work, but satin on the walls because it, it's, Really, it has a, a minor sheen to it, but it's not like shiny like a semi-gloss. But more importantly, it's not flat. So if it's something, if a child puts a dirty hand on it, it's not going to leave a handprint. You can wipe it right off, okay? Um, so again, these are rentals we're talking about. Um, all right, now, uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, okay, let me just go back up one second. I just want to make sure. Um, other things that aren't, remember, this is the basic form. There's more elaborate forms in your material. Um, doorknobs. I like to have new doorknobs on my doors. When I first buy a property, I replace all those because it has that mix. It gives it that nice, shiny, new look. The carpet's new. The paint's fresh. New doorknobs are like, man, this place looks like it's new. And I get better rinse. And the doorknobs, honestly, an interior doorknob, I can buy packs of them and, and get them for like 10 bucks. the good ones, okay? Also, uh, Electrical um, outlet plates, light switch plates, and outlet plates. I replace all those because you can get them for basically 10 cents a piece, and it's just pay somebody an hourly rate to go around and re replace all the uh, outlet covers and uh, light switch covers. Okay. All of that will really dress up a place without spending a lot of money at all. These are great ideas for you to, to use, guys. Well, let me do a quick pause here and check for questions. So hang on one second. Because we're going to move into part two here in a second. Let's go back to questions. Um, okay. Hey, Miho, how are you? Okay, so Fassel is asking, just so I'm clear, this report is used when I'm looking to invest or my client wants to invest in a property. Yeah, so Fassel, this is the one you're using. You know, you know how we go, Fassel, you know how in the beginning with rentals, 
we actually do more desk work. We do desktop work first. We get the inventory. We get all the information from the owners, all that we can get, income, expense, profit, loss, the whole nine yards. We do desktop analysis first. We know we're even getting the car yet. Once we've done all the desktop analysis and we determine that it makes sense for us to go look at the property, this is one of the forms we take with us to go to look at the property. Now, for me personally, Fastful, I, I know you're a broker. Uh, from a broker's perspective, I always have the, the my client fill out the forms. I have them take the pictures. I have them do all of that because they're the one buying the property. And I know as an investor, I want to, I'm an investor too, obviously. I want my investors to get used to doing the analysis because they're the ones ultimately making decisions and they're the ones ultimately spending the money. I know for me as an investor, I don't want anybody else doing that stuff for me. I want to do it myself because I want to know with certainty that I've got complete information. So we use these forms, have the, the investors fill them out. Okay. And you're really only doing this for maybe one or two or th maximum three properties. I mean, you've already done the desktop analysis. And on paper, the property already looks good. We just want to determine how much money we got to put into it. Okay. So in any case, back to this. Uh, we add all these things up, get a total and figure out what's it going to cost to actually remodel the property or improve the property so that we can do two things. Number one is actually rent the units out. You know, we want them to be um, safe, clean, reliable, and up to code. We want them to be service ready, all right? But more importantly, we may be able to raise the rents by making some of these minor um, corrections and improvements that we discussed, okay? Um, so it's, it's, it's basically, um, you're knocking off two birds and one stone, okay? You can improve the quality, you know, ensure that you're gonna get uh, uh, better tenants more easily. And quite frankly, you'll probably make more money, okay? Now let's look at a, at a, a very basic, um, cash flow worksheet. I'm oh, sorry, real quick, one more. All right, here's an, here's an example of what I did several years ago. Um, uh, what was the property? 3811 Wilkesboro, I think it was this one. It's funny, I've had, I've done thousands of properties and, and for some reason, guys, I can actually remember, I can remember the individual properties in the, in the worksheets um, because I, I did all the work. I did everything. I, did, I, I never relied on anybody else I never relied on the agent to do my investor work. Um, I did my work as an investor, and as an agent, I taught my investors how to do the same thing. And quite frankly, everybody made a lot of money. So in any case, you can see, we take all the costs for acquiring the, I'm sorry, once we've acquired a property, we add up all the costs for putting it back into service uh, at marketable rates, rental rates. We add up all the costs for you know, power washing, if we're going to do that, I put appraisal in here because generally we're going to have these reappraised once we've finished working with them, working on them, excuse me. Exterior paint, exterior siding, um, any roofing we're going to do, um, gutters, downspouts, security doors, storm doors. Um, I kind of get away from them, but, but you know, sometimes they're kind of nice, actually. Interior doors, ceiling fans, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are, I, I should have said this at the beginning of the, of the webinar, guys, real quick, just a quick pause. I want to apologize for missing last week's webinar. I, I, I did have strep throat. It was supposed to be last Tuesday night. I couldn't even talk, guys. Um, Katie Crow had a, a strategy call that day, and thankfully she rescheduled to the next day, and she, she must have, her intuition must have kicked in. But I, I just, I couldn't, I wasn't able to talk, and I apologize for missing that. Um, that very rarely happens. We generally try to do 40, 80 of these in the year. There's like four weeks, so I'll sometimes take off and spend time with my family or go to some type of, um, you know, other other work that I do. So, um, any case, uh, charitable work, that type of thing. So, in any case, back to this, mini blinds. Uh, windows, um, traditional windows, double hung, and also glass block windows if you have a basement and you want a glass block in a window, which I really do like to do that, by the way. Um, drywall work, interior paint, carpeting, ceiling tiles if you have any. I generally don't like them, but sometimes we've got to have them. Um, kitchens, we do replace kitchens, and they don't have to be that expensive. Check this out. Yes, you can actually replace a kitchen for $2,500, okay? Um, okay, bath, uh, tub coating, you don't have to replace a tub. Sometimes you can actually reglaze a tub, which is kind of neat. Looks like it's brand new, by the way. Um if you replace the tub, it's actually quite expensive. Uh, electrical service, you can see this job, we thought needed a new electrical service. 
light switches, plumbing, we replace some of the plumbing. Uh, what else do we do? Uh, uh, we replaced a furnace. We refer, excuse me, uh, replaced um, uh, a boiler heat. Uh, in any case, um, all of this, uh, the property clean out, we demo, we had to do some demo work. We tore out some of the old kitchen. Okay, removal of all that stuff can be a little bit pricey sometimes. Uh, we have cleaning crews come in once we're all done and clean the entire house, top to bottom, left to right, spotless, okay? Um, we parge the basement walls. So basement walls, you can coat them what's called parging, really dresses them up and adds a little bit of waterproof uh, to that. Any concrete work that has to be done, termite treatment, and other miscellaneous work. And you can see this project cost 28,000 bucks. We got a lot done for 28,000 bucks. One thing I really want to emphasize here is this. When you're in the business of investing, you will begin to work with people on a regular basis. And some of those people will be contractors. You want to pay your contractors well, but, but also you want to work with contractors that demonstrate loyalty, skills, and reliability and discipline and all those things you want to look for as if you were hiring them for an employee as an employee okay um, when you provide regular work for them and you can you can provide the direction uh, you you can actually save some money because contractors generally if you demonstrate that you're giving them regular work um, they're not going to gouge you number one but number two is you can get really good prices on things you know what it takes to do stuff and they know you know that okay um, over time. So real quick, let me check for questions again before we jump into the final piece. Um, let's see, that was uh, that was fast. So, okay, Cedric, hey Cedric, uh, where is the best place to get the cost, the cost ranges? Um, you can, Cedric, you can generally go to like a Lowe's or a Home Depot and ask them for um, for sample sheets, you can actually come in, Cedric, with a project list like this. Just bring in a project list from one of your recent projects and ask them to uh, price out the material for you, okay? Um, you can also go to, uh, Lowe's used to have what's called a bid room, and you can get bids on appliances and things like that. Pretty neat stuff. They also have their own uh, list of contractors they like to work with. Uh, but no matter what, Cedric, always screen them. De definitely, definitely do due diligence on all the contractors, okay? Um, there's also some online services. I haven't used them for a while, but you could you could Google, um, you know, average cost for repairs, and you can, you'll get a wide range of things. Generally, they're, they're a range. Um, things do change, but not much over time. Back in the 90s, when, uh, who was, Al Gore was, uh, was vice president, with all the stuff he was passing, what happened is uh, drywall prices were like going up and down. It was crazy. There were there was you know, three bucks a sheet today and nine bucks a sheet the next day. Um, two by four, same thing. With all the you know protection of all the of the tree and trees and lumber, two by fours, four by fours. It just it was like went through the roof and then it dropped back. It was just crazy. So um, any case, uh, you can go online and actually fill in your own sheets. They'll give you the prices online. And you can do sample sheets and keep them with you. Okay, so when you're looking at properties with clients, you can whip one out and say, look, these are the latest costs for two by fours and four by fours and drywall and everything. This is what a faucet costs. All that stuff you can get online. Okay, good question, too, by the way. Uh, let's see, William. Bill Morrow. Hey, Bill. Okay, uh, Bill Morrow, is the estimated repair cost list available somewhere on the website? Um, it, I don't know that it's on the website bill, but this is in part, this is in your material, all the, the material you got, uh, this is in there. Um, I will tell you though, you know, these numbers are definitely going to be dated because that sample, that example, I mean, I don't know where the example came from, but what, what I would generally, this is what I did. I always would go to my local investors club meetings just once a month and connect with everybody. And I would get to meet the contractors. And I would always ask them for samples of jobs they've done to give me a portfolio, like like a photo album, jobs they've done with cost sheets and all that. That's one of the best things you can do, actually, for Cedric and Bill. Just go to the next meeting and say, hey, I'd like to potentially work with you. Can you provide me a sample of some of the, some of the jobs you've done with the associated costs? They, they'll have that. If they don't, they're, they're, they're nuts or they're not telling you the truth. But they should have that because they need to absolutely estimate things uh by component and by hour and and 
In fact, you might want to get both. You want to see what they're charging by the hour and what they're charging a component would be the component of painting, for example, or the component of plumbing. Um, what are they charging to replace the copper in the house, for example? Um, material, material, and labor. So they'll, they'll, if you ask them, they'll give it to you, okay? Uh, matter of fact, you know what, Bill? I'd probably do that first, actually. So, okay, good questions. Let me let me do this. Let me go to the, th the next piece here. I want to go through, a, 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 by the way, we will spend another session just talking about contractors, okay? There's a lot more to this than meets the eye. Um, it is in your material that you can read, but I want to go over it with you live. Maybe we'll do that next week, actually, okay? Talk about contractors. Uh, but here's what I want to kind of wrap up here there. Uh, I'm going to spend a moment on this. I know some of you have seen this, but I want to explain how you actually use this relative to the cost sheet that we just came up with, okay? So first things first, number one, you're always doing this before you even go to the property. You're getting all the income and expense data. What are the gross rents, taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance and repair, property management costs? So you add up all the expenses. Then you take your gross rents, of course, subtract all the expenses. You end up with your net operating income so net operating income again is your rents minus expenses equals noi that's typically on a monthly basis and you want to uh, annualize that so take the monthly figures multiply times 12 and you get your annual figures which the lenders will want to see okay so you take your noi which is your cash in your pocket after noon expenses and deduct your mortgage payment from that and you got your monthly cash flow okay so we always do that first before we look at a property, but um, from this information, from your from your project sheet, your cost sheet for remodeling, and your cash flow sheet on the rental income, you're gonna determine what you're gonna offer on this property. And you're gonna offer what we call the ARV. I don't know if I have this in here or not. Um, yeah, let's, let's go back here. Um, Let's do this. I want to explain this to you because this came up this weekend. Generally speaking, when you're looking at a property, you're going to look at the income and expenses of the property. And based on that, you're going to, you're going to uh, make an offer on the property. Now, that's all well and good, assuming the property doesn't need any maintenance and repairs. Okay, There's no deferred maintenance. It doesn't need wiring and plumbing and so forth and so on. So whenever you determine the value of a property, this is really critical. I actually, please write this down. You then want to deduct the cost of the deferred maintenance. What's it going to cost you to, to remedy any deferred maintenance, like electrical, plumbing, and so forth and so on? You deduct that, though, that amount from what you're going to offer on the property, and then that's your new resulting offer on the property. It's an adjusted offer price because you've got to account for those, those deferred maintenance items, the capital improvement items, okay? Now, there is an exception here, and this is what came up this weekend. If you're going to be making improvements on a property that will result in increased rents, which means you're going to have now um, increased profits on the property, and yet your monthly expenses are really not going to change that much. You're not going to have higher taxes. You're not going to have higher um, utility bills. You're not going to have higher maintenance and repair bills because you're taking care of them. What I'm getting at is this. A lot of people have always asked me, say, hey, Gary, if I calculate the return on the property the way it is today, based on the numbers the owner gave me, and I determine my offer price based on that, and then I deduct what it's going to take to replace the roof, replace the furnace, and replace the kitchen, I'll never get my offer accepted. It's going to be way too low. And I understand that. So here's what you do. And I've had people tell me that I'm crazy. But I tell you, all the old gurus I learned from, every one of them said, at some point, you've got to grapple with this, and here's what you do. If you're going to have uh, increased rents on the property, that means you need to do what's called a pro forma. You're going to project what the real income and expense is going to be, profit and loss, in other words, after you've purchased the property and after you've made your repairs. You determine that value, in other words, what we call the after repair value, ARV. It's just like what we do when we buy a flip. When we buy a flip, we look at the after repair value, what it's going to look like once we're done remodeling, back off our profit margin and overhead, which is typically 30%, and 
And from that resulting figure, we'd back off um, the cost of capital improvements. It's really no different with rentals, guys. I know it's a rental property you're keeping. You're not flipping it, generally speaking. But the same principle applies. If you're going to be improving the performance of the property, you need to start with what is that future value after it's remodeled and the rents are increased. And then you back off the cost of the improvements to make that happen. Any deferred maintenance and also any capital improvements. Okay. Then you'll end up with a much more legitimate or reasonable offer. Okay. The fact, because if you don't do that, you're never going to be competitive. Number one, number two is any owner is going to say, well, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, if, if you're going to, make me an offer based on ways the way it's performing today and you're, you're going to penalize me for the deferred maintenance which is built into the current listing price i'll just keep the property make those improvements myself raise all the rents and then make and put it back on the market and you'll have to pay a higher price for it <laughs> okay so now within those two extremes you know purchase it based on the current performance and per purchase it based on the future performance Somewhere in between there is your is your medium, your happy medium. You're gonna you're gonna have to negotiate with somebody, but you're gonna be prepared because you're gonna have your estimates. You're gonna know what it's going to take to replace the roof, to replace the wiring, to change out to to paint, to change the the switch plates and the outlet plates and the doorknobs and the faucets and all that. And you add all that. You say you say, look, well, this is why this. I'm not trying to rip you off. This is just what it's gonna take for me to get this thing to that level. Now you got yourself a legitimate negotiation going on there. And you can always knock off of, of I always start off anywhere between five and 20% um, off of what I know I should be offering. I go lower, so I have room for negotiating. And sometimes if somebody really is in need, they're like, they just want to sell, they really want cash. I'll offer them cash, but I'm going to probably go in, I've gone in as much as 50% off, 50% off uh, what they want because I'm offering cash. And, it's not to be insulting. It's just, look, if you want me to offer cash, there's risk involved here. Here's my price if I offer cash. And I go much lower. And you'd be surprised at how many times you get those offers accepted. Okay. In any case, guys, that's what I wanted to show you tonight. That's like the final piece before you actually write offers. And then once you write offers, again, you've got to negotiate. And after that, it's a whole other uh, ball game, which we'll talk about on another webinar. But real quick, before we call it a day, let's check for questions here. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think we're actually caught up. Uh, Bill, Cedric, Fashel. Um, I think that's it, guys. So uh, I tell you what. Um, well, this is a rare, a rare occasion we actually get through our content. <laughs> um, if you do have questions, please let me know. I'll hang on another, another couple of minutes, um, and I'll go ahead and tap off. It's been quite a quite a ride for me this last, really since. Um, not just Friday, but I was spending all day Thursday preparing for that event. I was recovering from strep, and then I had to, to talk for three days. And then I, you know, had to do it all over again today. I drove up here and then taught today. Great class, by the way, in Jacksonville. But in any case, so I'm going to enjoy a good night's sleep tonight, and I hope that you all will too. I want to thank you all again for those of you at the event. Um, give me your feedback. Let me know if you want me to do one sooner than September. Um, I'd be glad to do it. Um, it may likely be somewhere like Charlotte, North Carolina, or or Atlanta, Georgia. I just you know maybe Washington D.C. I don't I don't know. Um, it'll probably be wherever I'm going to be, um, and we may do things a little bit differently. Um, I like the the way we did the event this time because everybody the feedback was 100% positive. We fed everybody. Um, it was it, people got along. We got to ask questions. There was a lot of Q and A, a lot of personal time between you and me. And, and we even attracted some some real pros coming in here to speak to speak to us. OK, and it was a spectacular venue. My gosh, the Omni Champions Gate, guys. I've stayed at a lot of places and that was one of one of the nicest, huge, giant complex, beautiful grounds. And the food was really good, guys. So uh, in any case, so look forward for the next one, because um, I, I actually had a lot of fun, I'm pretty tired, but it was really nice to get to see everybody in person. That that me was very fulfilling to not just be talking to you over webinars and over phones, but to actually see you in person. So that's um, that for me was probably the big the big takeaway for me. It's just being able to be with you guys in person. So, in any case, uh, welcome aboard to all the new folks. Um, uh, tell me what it is you want to talk about. And going forward, all of these webinars, guys, are based on your feedback. You tell me what you want to talk about. Um, and I prepare for that and give you what you want. So. 
Faisal says, great event. You did an awesome job. Thanks, Faisal. I appreciate that. Okay, guys, so I hope you have an awesome night, a wonderful week. Um, God bless all of you and your families, and we will see you next week, which is going to be next week is going to be the 28th, which is Wednesday. I'll see you next week, the 28th, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. California time. Okay, guys, God bless you and take care. Good night.